टर्बाइंसेस एंड न्यूरस वजह से वजह से शॉर्ट सीरी ऑफ विजय शंकर एस विजय एस कंप्लीट एस विजय स्वर्ण चार्ज में निकाले जाएंगे ऐसे ही सुबह सुबह जी पड़ेगा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ न्यूरोलॉजी बड़े स्पेनिक कॉलेज आफ्टर प्रैक्टिसिंग न्यूरोसर्जी फॉर ए ब्रीफ पीरियड इन न्यूरोलॉजी माइग्रेट इन टू इन एन एक्टिंग का बिटवीन दस फाइव ऑफ फर्दर ट्रेनिंग ए वर्क इन वेरियस न्यूरोलॉजी डिसिप्लिन्स इन लिंकी ए गोट स्पेशल ट्रेनिंग इन मिनिमल इंग्रेसिस फाइन सर्जी मुनीच जर्नी और मुझे एस मोर देन थर्टी इयर्स ऑफ क्लिनिकल एक्सपीरियंस इन न्यूरोलॉजिकल ट्रीटमेंट्स एस प्रोफेशनल कमिटमेंट फॉर यू डॉक्टर एसोसिएशन रेस्पेक्स न्यूरोसर्जी एंड यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ हॉस्पिटल कमेटी वापस मेंबर ऑफ रॉयल कॉलेज and for FRCs, Neurosurgery Examinations. Participate in the multi-centric randomness and method by of internal information, monitoring information and information connected by the primary university. And this I invite uh, the physician, please. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much, Bonanda, uh, for giving me this excellent opportunity to uh, talk in front of you all. Uh, my, my topic today is uh, just it follows uh, 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 radiation uh, and uh, uh, medical oncologist. So I hope it's going to be uh, just uh, uh, it's going to be as interesting as it was. Uh, my topic is recent advances in neurosurgery. It is very difficult to uh, to uh, discuss all the recent advances which happened in the past one or two decades in neurosurgery in one session. But I will try my best to uh, the best to uh, discuss with you, to share with you what. I have come across in the past decade. So, from the neurosurgical in the neurosurgical theatre, I just want to reiterate that uh, whatever advances happen, we still see through the microscope. Neurosurgeons, any neurosurgery is not without a microscope. So, we see all the brain structures, spinal cord structures only through the microscope. So, whatever technical advances what we have, it is going to just complement what we see through the microscope. And uh, as it has done, the endoscope has done a tremendous, tremendous impact in the brain also, in the brain surgery also. And uh, let me, there are quite a few places where we can use the endoscope. The first place we start with, with uh, the cranial endoscope. The most important place where we use the cranial endoscope is uh, in obstructive hypercapellus. Let me just go through the CSO pathway just to, to familiarize ourselves once again. The CSF is produced in the lateral ventricles. Most most of the CSF is produced in the lateral ventricles. It goes to the foramen of Munro into the third ventricle. From the anterior part of the third ventricle, it goes to the posterior part, where to the aqueduct, it goes to the fourth ventricle, and from there it gets distributed into the subarachnoid space, where it gets the abdomen. And uh, if there is a block in the from the posterior third ventricle at the aqueduct of the base or in the fourth ventricle. We can bypass the CSF by making a hole in the floor of the third ventricle. So that's the principle of endoscopic third ventricle ostium. So this is a, a diagrammatic view of what we do. We put a frontal lobe here, and it is a very very minor operation when you compare with even a shunt operation, uh, which where we are going to leave a shunt throughout life. So there is a usually a right frontal barrel from where we pass the endoscope into the. I will, I will show it in the video. So let me let me discuss this case, uh, which I would have I have done a surgery ten years ago. Ten years ago, this is a pineal region tumor. There is a posterior third ventricular tumor with a hydrocephalus. Here, what I would have done ten years ago was to put a ventricular shunt and then through this approach, there is a transcortical or transtentorial approach. It's a major surgery uh, in the sitting position or prone position. I have to access this tumor whether to debulk or take a biopsy. But with the advent of with the advent of endoscope, so now my endoscope is within the third lateral ventricle. So this is the choroid plexus. Whatever you see like a bead CV is the choroid plexus. Actually once we are within the lateral ventricle, that's what we are looking for, the choroid plexus. Once we identify the choroid plexus, we follow it and it goes through the foramen of mantra. That, that foramen is a foramen of mantra. And once we are within the third ventricle, once we are through the foramen of mantra, we are within the third ventricle, and what we see is the floor of third ventricle. 
to just to tell you the uh, structures there, this is the infant tubular basis, this is the optic chiasm in front of it, this is the, these are the mammary bodies, and this is our target, where we have to pierce to create a uh, turbid glossary. And uh, in the next video, the uh, glossary is being done. So by putting a hole there, we are going to enter into the posterior fossa. So we are seeing the basilar artery there and, and, and the pons there. So that is the ventriculostomy is done. It is as simple as that. And once that is done, one uh, appendix is sorted out, then the then the endoscope is angled posteriorly to see the tumor and, and the tumor is getting debugged. So there is no need to leave a uh, uh, shunt permanently in the patient's uh, body and there is no need to uh, do a very morbid surgery in the prone or sitting position for which most of the anesthetists object. So there is no need to do all those things. With the advent of endoscope, it is very simple. So where else can we use can we use the endoscope? This is the ENT territory through the nose. The ENT surgeons have been using uh, the nasal endoscope up to the sphenoid sinus for a while. And we actually got this, uh, got this. Uh, you know, we combine with them most of the time, and uh, we can go beyond the sphenoid sinus to access the pituitary tubes. We uh, we use the same appro approach with the help of a microscope in the past, but with the advent of endoscope, we have a good panoramic view. This is the optic nerve. These are the carotids, and this is the cerebrospinal. This is the clypes. So this panoramic view was missing through the microscope, and now we have got a fantastic panoramic view. And now, uh, since all our pituitary tumors are done only through the endoscope, without without a scar on the patient's body. So skull base surgery. The further further beyond beyond the pituitary, what we can do. This is the operation what we did, uh, what I did in, in 2002 uh, at Erod is that it's a Peter's apex uh, uh, cystic lesion. To approach that, I I had to go through a skull based procedure called uh, orbitozygomatic osteotomy. The craniotomy was done. That is uh, skull was removed, then the zygom was removed, then a lateral wall of the orbit was removed. Yes, it's a fantastic technique where we do not uh, handle the brain much, but it hand it, it gave a lot of morbidity to the patient. Because we had to open the orbit, we had to remove the zygoma and we fix it. There will be a big swelling, the patient will have trouble in chewing post-operatively. But with the advent of with the advent of endoscope, we can we can go through the nat natural passage of nose to reach this. The only thing what we have to do is just to drill the clitus there. So that's what we have done with the help of a EMP surgeon. So inside the sphenoid sinus, this is the cella. This tumor is beyond the cella, below the cella, so we are going below the cella, drilling the pipes. So, one, one, now, now we have reached the cyst. The cyst has been, you can see the cystic fluid there. And once the cyst is emptied, the wall is gradually peeled off. And at the end of the procedure, we can see the complete posterior fossa dura beyond which, yeah, complete uh, after that, we can see the posterior fossa dura beyond which there will be basilar artery and, and uh, box. So these are the advantages of endoscope. And next next advancement is neuronavigation. So this neuronavigation has come in a big way. And uh, just to let me explain it to you, it's the GPS. What the GPS, whatever you use in your cox. What is the principle of GPS? The earth is mapped to the satellite. In the same way, the GPS machine in your car is mapped to the satellite. So wherever your car is going, once you have pressed the destination, it, it gives you a map to reach the destination on the earth. The same principle is applied here. This is the tiny satellite within our theater. And this is the screen, GPS screen. This is the magnified form. And once what we have to do is, on the previous day, we have to do a special CT scan, five minutes time, and then just sit for more five more minutes to plan and register the patient to the to the GPS this, this satellite machine. Once that is done, intraoperatively, the the, GP, the neuro navigation machine just takes you to the tumor. So by doing this, 
we we our our incision size has come down and we minimal we damage the brain very minimally now and if if you can identify the vital structures like motor cortex or corticospinal tract preoperatively you can avoid injuring those those structures those structures uh, during surgery so here is an example this patient first went to a uh, 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 different hospital or where referred to a uh, radiation oncologist is a primarily an adenocarcinoma secondary deposit there the radiation oncologist rightly refused to give radiation because radiation is not much effective in cystic they wanted it to be removed so it is on the left side so speech may be affected and it is just just in front of the motor cortex and very close to the corticospinal tract so preoperatively some some uh, uh, homework was done in which this this purple thing is the motor cortex yellow is the corticospinal tract the tumor is sitting just in front of it all those things are are preoperatively identified in 3d on in all the three planes so once that is done our job becomes easy but here there is one more problem it is the left side so the patient's speech may also be affected so what else can we do our anesthetist came with an idea of awake craniotomy so this is awake craniotomy where we are uh, with the permission i am putting the patient's face um, uh, where the patient is not intubated she is just sedated at the time of putting the pins and uh, at the time of craniotomy so you can see the pin is there patient is getting break but there's no tube patient is awake she can talk she can move her lips uh, uh, all the training was given on the previous day by our neuro anesthetist and uh, as i told you this is this is the intraoperative that uh, uh, neuro navigation machine and the same patient so craniotomy is done when the patient is awake and at the time of the tumor removal the patient is talking and she is moving the right upper leg so when as soon as there is some difficulty in the movement of the limbs anesthetic wants us so we we proceed in a different direction so that at the end of the procedure the patient comes out without any neurological defects the patient went home fine and post operatively she received radiation and next for stroke stroke surgery and also for moi moi surgery for stroke surgery we have been doing when there is a carotid stenosis we have been doing a carotid stenting or or carotid endarterectomy but this block when the block is intracranial or when there is moya moya disease we do bypass for for the brain it is something like uh, bypass for the heart where this is the this is the principal uh, because of lack of time i am not showing the whole procedure this is the post operative picture you can see the superficial temporal artery is bypassed to the distal middle cerebral artery and the distal flow is drained so this is the treatment of choice the bypass procedure for the brain is the treatment of choice for moya moya disease and there are some other indications also as i have mentioned here then next advancement is in spine surgery minimally accessible spine surgery has come in a big way we can do all types of spinal surgery with mis that is minimal access spinal surgery and uh, we can do lmds that is lumbar microdiscectomy we can uh, relieve canal stenosis with a very very tiny incision and even tlf can be done with minimally invasive spinal surgery okay nowadays the surgery for radiculopathy that is uh, brachialgia and sciatica our our surgical incidence has gone down by 90% only 10% of the patients with progressive neurological deficit end up in an operation like spinal cord compression or choroid when a compression end up in surgery the rest of them undergo mere nerve block with image guidance this is image with the uh, cm guidance and this is the cervical with the uh, ct guidance we block the nerve root by doing so we relieve the inflammation of the nerve once the inflammation is gone the patient is relieved of the pain there is no need for the disc to disappear it will automatically disappear whether we do surgery or not so at the end of 6 months if you do the scan in patient both the patients who had undergone surgery and who had been managed with conservative measures the scan look almost the same so this gives this image guided nerve root block either by cm or by or by uh, ct gives you very good relief 
from the pain instantaneously and most of them, that is 90 percent of them, can be avoided of a spinal operation. The next advancement is intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring and we are very proud to say that we have got a uh, qualified in-house neurophysiologist. He is a doctor trained at Ames, so he helps us to preserve all the cranial nerves when we do, whether it's uh, whether it is sixth nerve or third nerve or, or whether it is fifth nerve or seventh nerve or lower canal nerves, we can preserve each and everything. This is a CP angle surgery where our success of preserving the seventh nerve after acoustic neuroma surgery is almost 95%. And same way, intraoperative monitoring can be used for spinal surgery also. All these complex spinal uh, tumors can be removed successfully without much neurological deficit with the advent of, with the introduction of intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring and it's a six weeks old hangman fracture where the malunion has already happened here the patient needs to be fixed both from the front as well as from the back after reduction, uh, forceful reduction in fact because the malunion, the malunion has already happened so this was possible only with intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring with excellent result. So the other few advancements are like uh, visceral functional neurosurgery. The spasticity can be relieved by intrathecal baclofen pump, and the patient with intractable pain, cancer pain, the pain can be improved with uh, intrathecal morphine. Dorsal column stimulator. It is useful for failed backs. Patients might have undergone one or two uh, uh, LMD surgeries, that is lumbar micro uh, surgeries then uh, uh, lumbar fusion surgery, in spite of all those things, if the patient still has got back pain or leg pain, uh, in, you know, in those days they didn't have any other option, pain back syndromes. But these patients can be improved with this, this new technique called dorsal column stimulator. It is just like a pacemaker which we give for the heart. Here uh, an electrode is placed on the dorsal surface of the spinal cord and this battery and you know, can be operated from outside, we can change the amplitude, we can change the uh, frequency. By doing so, the patient's back pain and leg pain selectively or in total can be relieved. Epilepsy surgery it has been in work for, for almost for three decades. The advancement is introduction of dedicated epileptologists who are, you know, who are very much trained in, in identifying the focus of the lesion and, uh, and the focus of the epilepsy and also they come with us to the theater this is intraoperative electrocorticography and they will not leave us until we remove the focus because in a, in a temporal lobotomy and amyotrophic hippocampactomy surgery we do not, really do not know how much of the hippocampus has to be removed we just remove the head and body of the hippocampus and come out but the 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 epileptic focus can come even further posterior so by putting these electrodes on the brain on the, during the surgery our epileptologist can guide us whether there is still some remaining focus or not so that by improving uh, the success of, of epilepsy surgery finally deep brain stimulation it is again an implantation of uh, a neuro stimulator like uh, a pacemaker within the brain at selective focus and uh, by changing the amplitude and the frequency of, of the uh, uh, pacemaker, we can improve the symptoms of Parkinson's, essential tremors, dystonia, sometimes chronic pain, and also major depression. So all these all this, uh, new techniques and our success is because of our uh, good neurosurgical team led by Dr. Suresh Babu and uh, my colleague, other colleagues, Dr. Rupesh, myself, and these are our neuroarthritis and our neurophysiologists. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, please. Imagine we have uh, got a complete tumor resection. Uh, if the tumor is not 
over in lo a local area. Um, and even we use intraoperative ultrasound to, to uh, enhance our perception. Uh, but uh, post, after post radiation, post chemotherapy, we do come across with recurrence uh, after after six months or uh, after a year. But as you mentioned in your talk, the the glioma ten years ago is different, and glioma now is completely different because the prognosis. I know uh, um, a young patient of in the, who first had glioma in the 30s lived almost for 10 years by repeated operations and repeated uh, radiations and uh, newer modalities of chemotherapy. So the glioma 10 years ago is not the glioma now. The patient has got a lot better prognosis now with the uh, with, uh, limited modality. Thank you very much. Now I request uh, Dr. Perumal, a past president, to hand over the certificate of organization to Dr.